Thank you for the opportunity to stand and be able to, to preach today. Thank you for the opportunity to stand and be able to, to preach today. When Dr. Stone texted us to tell us he was going to be here, I tried to convince him to go ahead and do it, but for some reason he wouldn't buy into that idea today. And uh, so I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to stand and be able to share with you a little bit about uh, what's on my heart and a little bit about what God has uh, been doing and where he is. Dr. Stone's already mentioned to you, uh, many of you know about the doctoral program and where I am and what's going on in regards to that. That. And so uh, part of the process of earning your doctorate of ministry degree uh, is that you're required to develop a project that will benefit your church family, something that you feel like is a need, something that you feel like will enhance the ministry, that will move the ministry forward. And so a bulk of what you do is creating that project and then over time implementing that project in the life of your church. And so after prayer and really just looking at where we were uh, as a church family, uh, talking with other individuals, talking a lot with Miss Cindy about this, I decided to develop what we will be calling, and you'll hear a lot more about this in the weeks and days ahead, is what we will be calling a next generation ministry plan. Dr. Stone's already mentioned a little bit about next generation ministry and who that encompasses. And the idea behind the plan is, is that for most of our churches and our church being one of those churches, many of our churches have kind of followed a model of what we would call silo ministries. Uh, and basically what that means is, is that all of our ministries for the most part stand alone. They're independent of the ministries around them or the ministries near them. And one of the areas that we, that we see that in is in really in student ministry. When I'm, and I talk about students, I'm really talking about birth all the way through college students. And so what we have is in the life of our church or what we have had in the life of our church is is that really before Miss Cindy came, preschool ministry kind of was its own thing. Children's ministry was its own thing. And Miss Cindy's done a great job of kind of bringing those two ministries together to connect. Youth ministry kind of did its own thing. And then what little bit of college ministry we had, college ministry kind of functioned independently. And there wasn't a lot of overlap between those ministries. The Next Generation Ministry Plan does away with silo ministries and brings all four of those ministries under the umbrella of a next generation ministry plan. Out of that basically comes a common goal, a common theme that all four ministries will share. This is what we want to accomplish. This is what we want to happen in the life of students. And we kind of sat down with a group of adults in our church and we said, what do we want to see in our college age students when they finish college, when they move into a career vocation? And then how do we back up and begin at birth getting them where we want them to be? And so out of that came this plan that's called the Next Generation Ministry Plan. And you'll see a whole lot more about this. Uh, and we and days that come ahead and part of this is that one way that we will do that is by partnering with parents uh, by partnering with workers those of you who volunteer and serve in children's ministry and preschool ministry and children's ministry and youth ministry and then also partnering with the students and so we want to make sure that we're not leaving anything out as we move forward and as we make this happen and so that is kind of how this came about we do not have time today to go into all of this or to go into all of this and you'll be thankful that we're not um, and so what I want to do is just kind of share with you really today what are the biblical foundations for our next generation ministry plan what scriptures are we using to push us to move us forward to get us to where we where we need to be let me say this to you this morning as well many of you over the past three years have been so faithful to pray and to ask me how things are going and I just cannot tell you how thankful I am for you and the impact that you have made uh, in my life I covet your prayers over the next three weeks and I'll tell you why first of all a week from today this has to be completely edited and in its final version and there's still a lot to be done and then also about three weeks from tomorrow uh, I will actually have my oral defense and so just pray for me as we kind of journey toward that a little nervous about those two things and what God's going to do and how that's going to all come together uh, but excited at the at the same time as I begin to look and as I begin to research for my paper, as I begin to unfold scripture and look at scripture, as I begin to look at where we are as a, as a nation, where we are as a society, one of the things that I really begin to see and begin to understand, and I think most of you in this room can agree with this, is that we as a whole, as believers and as a nation, we are really dropping the ball on when it comes to impacting the next generation. That the statement has been made over and over again by multiple people that as goes the family goes the nation. But I would tell you that as goes the family goes the church, then the nation. And we are seeing the impacts of not impacting the next generation even in the life of our church. We're seeing it all around us. 
We're seeing it on all the way from Washington, D.C., all the way down to the local area. We're seeing in the lives of adults in our church. And as many of you know, we, we celebrate and we rejoice often on Sunday mornings about how many are here. Uh, and we, today we may have over 400 that will be in all three worship services today. But yet there's 600 people that are on the rolls that won't be here today. And, and following the Lord and being in His Word and studying His Word and desiring to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, being in the church really has taken back seat to everything else in our lives. We go to church when it's convenient. We open the Bible when there's not anything else to do. We study the Word when we can't find anywhere else to be or anything else to get involved in. And we're beginning to see the impacts of that all across our land and especially, I believe, in the hearts and the lives of our churches. On an average, I'll tell you this, on an average, students who grow up in the church and graduate and go off to college, 66% of them drop out of church after they graduate high school. Some of them come back after they're in their late 20s. Many of them do not. And so how do we reverse that? How do we change that? How do we make that move in a different direction? And we do that by impacting the next generation. If you have your word this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be in this passage today. Let me share with you that for the Next Generation Ministry Plan, there are really three key passages of scriptures for the foundations for this ministry. And we do not have time today to go into all of them. Deuteronomy 6 will be our focus for today. But let me just mention to you the other passages of scriptures that are foundational are Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, you and I are commanded, you and I are encouraged that we should be maturing in our faith. And that we should no longer be on what uh, on the milk of the word, but we should be on the meat of the word. And that as believers, as people who are growing in our relationship with Christ, the writer of Hebrews says, some of you should be teachers by now. You've been sitting under the teaching of God's word for a long, long time, and yet you're still not able to teach it. You're still not able to give it back to somebody else. And so it's important that you and I are maturing in our faith. And then Ephesians chapter 4 then really addresses the ministry staff and where we are and is reminded that as staff, my, for me, Dr. Stone, for Gil, for Miss Cindy, for our new pastor that will come, is that we have a responsibility to equip the saints for the work of the service. To equip you as Sunday school teachers and RA leaders and youth workers and all the things that go into that. And those are the additional passages of Scripture today. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses begins here in this passage of Scripture and says, Now this is the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess. And just remind you there as we stop, just remind you that Moses and the Israelites are on the plain of Moab. They have come out of Egypt. They have not yet made their way into the promised land. They're in that 40-year period of time. And as you study Scripture, as you look at Scripture, some of you have heard this before, is that it took God a day to get them out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And so they're still in this process of wondering. And so God is still instructing them and teaching them. And he says, so that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. These words which I have commanded you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you today, Father, for the opportunity that we have to dig into your word, to study your word. Father, to grow and to mature, and Father, to, to gain insight into how we as a church family can impact the next generation, how we can make a difference in their lives and how we can help them to grow and to mature. I pray today, Father God, that you speak to each and every one of us. I pray that you would be honored and that you would be glorified today in everything that we do. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. We're going to kind of look today, really beginning in verse 4, and kind of journeying through the remainder of this chapter this morning really quickly. And I want you to kind of see a couple of things here as we begin in this passage of Scripture. If you look there in verse 4, 
Moses begins by using the word here. Verse 4 and really the verses that follow uh, would have been known to the Israelites as the, as the Shema. It was really important to them. It was uh, something that they would have studied, that they would have known, they would have taken to heart with them. They would have passed it on from generation to generation. It was really important to them that it was a key part of, of their life. It was essential to their faith. And they studied it and they knew what it talked about. And so this passage of scripture begins what is known as the Shema. Moses begins with that word here. And it's not the word here from the standpoint that you and I sometimes are guilty of. We're talking to someone and we are hearing them, but we're not hearing them. And we walk away and we're like, now what was that conversation about? Or are we here with one ear and it goes out the other ear? Sometimes children are guilty of doing when their parents are asking them to do something. But the way that in which Moses uses the word here in this passage of Scripture, he is saying to the Israelites in this passage of Scripture, what I'm about to tell you demands a response. You can't just hear it and walk away, but you've got to hear it and you've got to respond to what I'm about to tell you because it's going to make a lasting impression upon your life and the life of those who come after you. And so he's trying to grab their attention. He is trying to state really quickly, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And then he continues by saying to them, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. I think that for you and I, one of the reasons that we are seeing such a decline, I believe, in spiritual things and in discipleship and being the people that God has called us to be, that we as a nation, we as a church, have forgotten that the Lord is our God. He's one deity. He is very much God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But not only is He that, but He is the only God. There are, there are no others. And I think in the society and the way in which we live today, we're allowed all these other things to come into our hearts and to come into our lives that oftentimes serve as gods, as little G-O-Ds. I've said this many times in my ministry to our students. You've heard this from other people. And we make this statement all the time that God is to be first in our lives. And I'm not telling you that that is completely wrong. But I believe that when we use that phrase, then it automatically implies that there's a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And at any moment... Those things can change rank and those things can change position. And I believe, church, what we've got to get back to is not that God is to be first in our lives, but God is to be your life. He is to encompass everything that you do. From the moment that you get up, as we'll see in the moment, to the moment that you go to bed, He is to be your life. Every thought, everything that you and I do we should have a mindset of what would Christ do? How would he respond? How would he live? And I believe that one of the reasons that we're seeing that, that, that decline and the lack of impact is that we have failed to teach and apply this simple truth that he is the only God. There are no others. And anything that we love or value or place higher than him, we have allowed to become a God in our lives. And we've got to help the next generation to understand the difference. He goes on to tell you and I, how do we do that? How do we make sure that, that God is our life? And he begins there in verse 5 by saying, And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 verse 37, when asked what is the greatest commandment, says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Jesus adds a little extra word in there and I'll kind of tell you a little bit about that. When you begin to look at this passage of scripture, the idea that you and I are to love God with all of our heart, for the Old Testament and for the Israelites, that really would have meant the mind. They, they used that word heart to equate to the mind. And so everything that comes into the mind, that they were to love the Lord with every thought that crossed their minds. Jesus breaks those two things out and uses the word heart and mind because not only does he want you and I to love him with all of our thoughts, but he also wants you and I to love him with all of our emotions. And he throws that word in there to clarify, to bring clarity to you and I today. But he also says in this passage of scripture that you and I are to love him with all of our soul. That word soul literally means breath. With every breath that you take, with your entire being, you and I are to love the Lord our God. And then he goes on to say in that passage of scripture that you and I are to love him with our might. That we are physically to love him with all of our strength, with everything that we have. And you and I do that as we begin to serve him, as we begin to respond to what he's calling you and I to do. And I know that sometimes in my life, along the way, I have not always loved him with all of my life. 
with my whole entire being. There have been moments in my life that I have chosen to not give him something or to withhold something from him in my life. And yet he is saying, I want you to love me with everything you have. Nothing is off limits. Probably the best way that I can illustrate that to you today is much in this manner. This afternoon, you get done with Sunday school and you go have lunch and you go home and you're sitting at your house and all of a sudden you hear a knock on the door. You're not expecting company and you know it's not family because whoever it was knocked. They didn't just walk in your house. And so you're like, who in the world possibly could be at my house this afternoon? And so mom, dad, husband, wife, one of you gets up and you go to the door and you look through the peephole and lo and behold, there stands Dr. Stone. He is making a surprise visit. At that very moment, you go into panic mode and you start screaming as best that you can to the rest of your family so he can't hear you to clean up the house. And things start being thrown everywhere, under the sofa, behind the doors. You start going and you start closing the bedroom doors and the bathroom doors. And after finally, after everything is somewhat tidy and neat, you open the door and you invite Dr. Stone simply into the foyer. If he is fortunate and if he is lucky, he gets invited into the living room, but that is it. And at that moment, you are praying that Cheryl is not redecorating and he's come to get ideas of what they can do because you don't want him to go in your bedroom and to see the clutter and to see the mess and you've closed those doors. Sometimes in our lives, we are guilty of doing that in our relationship with Jesus. We say to him, I'm sorry, that part of my life is off limits, and we close the door. This part of my life is off limits, and we close the door. Why? And I don't know why we do that, because he already knows what's there. And he is saying to you and I, you have got to give me your whole entire being. And it begins with you and I loving him with everything that we have that we might impact the next generation. Not only do they need to see us teach it, but they need to see us live it. They need to see it as an example that we're living out our faith, that we're, that we're practicing what we preach. I never will forget, many of you will remember this, when Dr. Ivan Park was here a long time ago and back in the interim before, and he was preaching the message, and I really can't remember if it was in here, if he actually was speaking to our youth, but we were talking about the importance of church attendance. We were talking about the importance of going to, to God's house and being with the Lord, and he said, and it probably was this time of year, because he made the statement, he said, I know what some of you are thinking, and he said, some of you are thinking, oh, but Dr. Park, I can worship the Lord on the deer stand. And I never will forget what he said. This was his response that day. Yeah, but what's your purpose for being there? It's not to worship the Lord. You can worship the Lord right before a baseball game on Sunday morning, but that's not your purpose for, for, for being there. And that's an indication, I believe, that we're not loving the Lord with all of our heart. We're allowing other things to take first place in our life. We're allowing other things to be more important. And he says to you and I in this passage of Scripture that we are to totally surrender to him, that he is to be our life. And so it begins with you and I teaching the next generation. It begins with you and I being an example to the next generation. But there's something else that I want you to see here, and I want you to see in this passage of Scripture this morning, whose responsibility is it? And it's really a twofold responsibility as you and I look at it today. I want you to look, first of all, back in verse, I believe back in verse 1. It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments of the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. And then in verse 2 it says, so that you, your sons, and your grandsons. And then if you go over to verses 6, it says, These words which I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And you shall teach them when you sit down and when you, in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. We're going to look at those last two in a moment. And so I would say to you today, based on those verses of Scripture, that the responsibility, and I would say to you, the primary responsibility for impacting the next generation, the primary responsibility goes to the parents. Moses is talking to the parents in this passage of Scripture, and he is saying to them, it is your responsibility to teach your children my word. It's your responsibility to teach them what God's truth says in this passage of Scripture. And he says, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, when you come back home, before you go to bed, all throughout the day, that you have the responsibility Parents, God has called you to be the primary disciple maker in your children's life. 
God has called you to be the spiritual influencer in their life. Your influence is huge. And I know that sometimes as students begin to move toward the teenage years, you oftentimes think that your impact and your influence is not as great as it once was. But I will tell you that statistics and studies show completely the opposite. Parents, you still have a great impact on your children. They're watching you. They're listening to you. They're, they're watching to how you respond. Let me give you a couple of examples when it comes to being the primary disciple maker and the spiritual influencer in your child's life. Dr. Stone may have shared these before. When it comes to salvation, if a family that is not believers and, the, and a child in that family comes to know the Lord first, before mom, before dad, there's a 5% chance that the rest of the family will come to know the Lord if the child comes to know the Lord first. If the mother comes to know the Lord first, there's a 17% chance or probability that the rest of the family will come to know Jesus. But listen to this. If the father accepts Jesus first and comes to know the Lord first, the probability increases to 93% that the rest of that family will come to know the Lord. Mothers, please hear me. I am not saying to you that, you're, that your role and that your responsibility is any less. It's not. You, you make a big difference. And some of you in this room may be single moms and doing the best that you can to get your children to church. But dads, you have a huge priority. And I tell you why, because Scripture's given it to you. God's Word says that you are to be the spiritual leader of your home. And therefore, we see what happens when dad is. We see the difference that it makes. I'm thankful for, for moms that are, that are getting their children in church or making sure that their children are where they are supposed to be. For me, the first eight years of my life, that was the case. For my sister, the first, I guess, five years of her life, that was the case. My mother and my grandmother made sure that we were in church. Every Sunday morning, my grandmother, my mom's mother, would pull up to our house and her little Sandy Brown Nova and take us to church every Sunday morning. My daddy was 40 before he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so I was about eight or nine years old. But I will tell you that when my daddy came to know the Lord, it rocked our world. We saw our dad going to church for the very, very first time. Not going fishing, not doing all these other things on Sunday. It no longer became a question, what are we doing on Sunday? Because the response was, what day of the week is it? Oh, it's Sunday. And that simply meant we were going to church. And it makes a difference. When it comes to church attendance, listen to these statistics. If a father doesn't go to church, there's a 1 in 50 probability that his children will go to church when they're adults. If the father does go to church, that increases to somewhere around two-thirds of, of their children will actually attend church. If both parents are in church, then the probability is 72%. Parents, your impact is enormous, is huge on the life of your children. Not only that you have them in church, but that you're living before them every day what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I think that for so many of us, we have bought into this idea that being a Christian is simply, as I tell the youth all the time, that being a Christian is simply getting your fire insurance, making sure that you're not going to spend eternity in hell. But that is not what this word says. The, this word says that being a Christian is a lifelong adventure. It's a lifelong journey that you and I are to be disciples, that you and I are to be followers of Jesus Christ, that you and I are to be growing in our relationship so that every day that we look and that we sound and that we act more and more and more like Jesus. And parents, your children are watching you. A friend of mine who just recently left First Baptist Church of Yazoo City to go and to be youth minister at another church about three or four years ago, their church invited Richard Rawls to come and to speak to a parents meeting. Richard Rawls is one of the, the lead youth ministers in, in, our, in our nation. He's on staff at Southwestern Seminary. Uh, he actually wrote and began what we now know today as the True Love Waits movement. And he has been huge in all of that. And they invited him to come and to speak. And he was simply speaking to an audience of adults. And he said, adults, I'm not going to ask you to literally get up and move, but I want you to envision with me just for a minute. And I believe this applies to parents and grandparents, but especially to parents as we're talking about you today. And he says, I want you to imagine just for a moment that I'm going to ask you to move. And he said, over here on the right side of the room is a board, is a sign that simply says, non-believer. 
No one in that home, dad nor mom, is a believer. They, they know who Jesus is. They, they've read about Jesus, but they've never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus. And so over on this side of the room stands that sign. In the middle of the room stands another sign, and on that sign it simply says, Saved, but Casual Christian. And how many folks in our church have a personal relationship with Jesus, but their faith is casual. It's convenient. I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to read the Word. I'm going to do what I need to do when it's convenient, when it's okay, when I'm not going to be pressured or be uh, and put in an awkward situation. And then he said, then over on this side of the room is another sign that says, disciple, follower, committed servant of the Lord. And he said, parents, you are in one of those three places today. You have got to pick where you are. There's no, there's no in-between place. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to just in your mind to stand up and I want you to come and stand by the sign that represents you and represents where you are in your spiritual journey. He paused and he waited just for a few minutes and he said, now I want you to turn around in your mind. I want you to find your children in the, in the, in the, in the audience in the congregation. And he said, now when you, when you have found them, let me share this with you. Wherever you are standing today, that is where your children will be 10 years from now. Because they're watching you. They're watching what you do. They're watching how you live out your faith. They're watching what's important to you. Parents, what are you communicating to them by where you spend your time on Sunday? Do, do they see you reading your scripture and reading your word? Do they see that serving in the church is important? Do they understand that God is the only God in your life? Or do they see you question it? Do they see you doubting it? Do they see you wondering if, it's, if things are going to come true? Do you trust God with their future? That they're watching all of those things. And you and I have a responsibility to impact them, to make a difference. Parents, you are the primary disciple maker for your children. Now that doesn't negate the rest of us in this room because if you go on and look at the rest of this passage of Scripture, we have a responsibility to adults. And if you look in the remainder of this passage of Scripture, beginning there in verse 8, I believe, it says, And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. If you and I had lived in this period of time and we'd have been a part of what Moses was doing in this passage of Scripture, what we would have seen is this, is that for the adults, for the Israelites that understood the Shema, that understood God's Word, that on their left wrist there would have been a small container that probably would have been tied with some type of leather, and inside of that would have been Scripture. On their forehead, on their frontal, there would have been another one that would have been attached to them somewhere. As you approach their house, there would have been a, some type of a container on the doorpost before you entered that contained scripture. As you entered into their home, depending on how many rooms they may or may not have, but as you entered into every room into the house, there would have also been scripture. And so scripture and God's word was continually before children, whether it was grandchildren or whether it was children in the community and their, in their area, but they were constantly seeing other adults share God's word. And church family, you and I have a responsibility to come alongside parents and to reinforce what parents are already learning, what parents are already teaching their children at home. That is why we need Sunday school teachers. That is why we need RA and GA leaders, why we need youth volunteers, why we need chaperones, why we need nursery workers. Not just to fill a spot, but that you and I might have the opportunity to impact the next generation. It's all of our responsibility. And you and I as adults are to come alongside of parents and to reinforce what God is already teaching them. You and I can make a huge impact in the life of children. I've already shared with you a moment ago about my, about my grandmother, about my mom's mother. And not only was she responsible for taking us to church, but she lived her faith for us as, as her grandchildren. And I can not tell you the number of times that I would go into her house, even after I was a teenager and even on into college, and that sitting in the living room on her, on her end table or on her coffee table would be her Bible. And very seldom did I see her Bible closed. More times than not, her Bible was open to a different passage. And I never will forget, probably 15 or 16 years old, asking her the question, Granny, why, why is it open? And her response being, because I read it every day. And then my response being, yeah, but you've been doing that for years. 
And her response being, yes, because every time I read it, God teaches me something new. She didn't know that I was watching. She didn't know that, that I was watching what she was doing and how important it was for me to see her faith. The fact that Kim is here today, I'll share you with you. I know there was a lady in our church growing up. We kind of went through numerous youth ministers along the way, but there was a lady in our church by the name of Betty Butler. Miss Betty was probably in her late 50s, her early 60s, and redheaded, and I'm just going to tell you, if you know anything about redheads, she lived up to every, everything you can imagine. But let me tell you something. She loved teenagers. She loved making a difference in our hearts and making a difference in our lives. She taught Bible drill. I hated Bible drill, okay? I was not good at Bible drill. If there was a makeup drill, I was going to be at that makeup drill. But on Sunday afternoons, Miss Betty would have all the teenagers over at her house to study God's Word and to learn the books of the Bible and to learn Scripture. If that church bus was going to a conference or to summer camp, Miss Betty was on that bus to, to chaperone that trip. If a youth minister left us, she was there to love on us and to comfort us. She was there to teach God's Word to us. Miss Betty had never heard the terminology next generation plan, but let me tell you, she impacted the next generation. And church family, that's what this church needs. We need more adults impacting the next generation. We need more adults that currently your children have already grown and maybe you're raising your grandchildren. We need you to come alongside parents and to pray for them and encourage them as they raise their children in the way of the Lord. We as a church staff have a responsibility to equip parents to, breathe, to be that primary disciple maker. But parents, let me say to you very clearly, God has not called us as your church staff to be the primary disciple maker. He's called you to be the primary disciple maker. And if we're going to make a difference, if we're going to impact the next generation, then we've got to get back to what God's Word says. And we've got to teach the truth. We've got to live the truth. We've got to accept our responsibility, first of all, as parents, that your responsibility is to be the primary disciple maker. But for the rest of us in this room, adults, we've got to accept our responsibility to come alongside those children. You'll hear me, you'll hear Gil sometimes, you'll hear Miss Cindy sometimes, and, and I love to use this phrase, I love to say church family, because we're a family. And because we're a family, we all have a responsibility to the children that God brings to this place. If you read my scope article, probably as we have learned as church staff, not many people read the scope, but we love to print it just for the fun of it. And, um, but if you did read it, you'll notice in there that on Wednesday nights, from preschool all the way through 12th grade, we're having somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 students here on Wednesday nights. They're here. The question is, are we going to impact them? And how are we going to impact their parents? How are we going to make a difference in their parents' lives? Let me close with this this morning. A couple of weeks ago, as I was studying for school and getting ready, I came across this this morning, and I think it kind of illustrates a little bit of what I'm trying to say to you today and the importance of your walk with the Lord, the importance of you having your children in church and teaching them God's Word. And I want you to listen to this, and then we'll close following this. It says, Take your kids to church. Make the effort. Wake them up early. Fool with the belts and the buckles and the fancy hair bows. Endure the sleepy, grumpy faces and the misplaced shoes. Run around like a mad person, gathering everyone's everything and trying to get out the door on time. Hop into the car with a shoe in each hand. Give those babies a Pop-Tart and some milk and let them eat in the car. If it's raining, get wet. You would for a football game. If it's cold, get a jacket. You would for the fair. If you're tired, go tired. But take those babies to church. You know why? Because Jesus is there. He's there, and he'll meet them, and he'll meet you too, Mom and Dad. He'll be there in the sweet smile of their Sunday school teacher as she greets them in their room. He'll be there in the countless goldfish and apple juice and the filling of their little bellies and hearts. He'll be there in the hug from a sweet friend and the encouraging smile that assures you that they just barely made it, but they made it. He'll be there in the sacred words read from the Bible, speaking truth into their little lives, impressing upon their hearts. He'll be there in the worship and the raised hands and the watery eyes and the whispers of praise. So take them. Carry all their Bibles and drawings and toilet tube creations. Sit by them in worship. Open your Bible and open theirs. 
Show them how to find the scripture the pastor is preaching from. Show them how to worship. Explain to them why he's worthy of worship. Let them see you laugh and cry and praise and study. Forgive their wiggles and paper wrestling and know that they're listening even when it seems like they aren't. Ask them questions and answer the ones that they ask you. Introduce them to Jesus. Tell them of his greatness, of his power, of his faithfulness. Tell them with your words and show them with your life. Tell them what he's done for you, how he's changed you by his grace and his forgiveness and his goodness and his love and his mercy. Tell them how they can be changed too. Point them to Jesus and point them over and over and over and over and over again. Take your kids to church. They'll love it there. It's the only place where they can go and just be themselves. They don't have to be good enough or smart enough or athletic enough. They don't have to perform for approval or for achievement. They just get to go and hear how much God loves them. Just because they're them. Just because he created them, they're valued. They're wanted. Their worth isn't based on their grades that they make or their ability to throw a curveball. It's not dependent on their performance or their skill level. And they need a little more of that, don't you think? A little more grace and a little less pressure. A little more love and a little less demands. Take your children to church. Take them to church before you take them to the ball field or the gym. Before you take them on vacation or to grandma's house or to the backyard to play. Take them to church. Let them know it's a priority. Show them it has eternal value. Let them see you sit... Let them see you set aside time in your, in your schedule for God's Word. Let them see you choose church over other extracurricular activities. I promise that you won't regret it. I promise that it won't come back void. Take your children to church. And I would say to you today, impact your children. And impact the children of this church for the next generation. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you today for the opportunity that we have to come and, Father, just to be in your house and to be, Father God, a part of what you are doing here. And, Father, I thank you for the children that are represented in this room today, for the children that are part of our church family, and, Father God, for what you're doing in the lives of our, of our church. I thank you, Father, today for your word and for the, the, word, the teaching that we find from Moses. Father God, that we have a responsibility as parents, as adults, as leaders to impact the next generation. And Father God, if we're going to see a difference in our church and we're going to see a difference in our nation, then Father, it begins in the home. Father, it begins with parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and other individuals, Father God, coming along the side of children and making a difference in their hearts and in their lives, Father. Lord, may we not neglect our responsibility to teach them the truth of your word, not only by our words, but Father God, also by our examples. We pray and we ask this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. In just a moment, Dr. Stone's going to come and stand. I'm going to come and stand as well. And today, what I'm really going to ask of you today, especially as parents and maybe as grandparents, that maybe you would spend some time at the altar this morning praying for your children. The greatest impact that you can have on their life is to pray for them. To pray that God will protect them, that he will guard them, that he will bring them up under the, the nurture of the Lord. And pray that you will be the disciple maker that God's called you to be. But there may be others here this morning who are looking for a church home. We'd love to have you to come and be a part of this church family. Or maybe in recent days you've been wondering about how you can be a, a Christian and you want to know more about that. We'd love to tell you about that as well. Or maybe you've made a public profession. You want to make a public profession of faith. We're here this morning to do that as well. The altar is open. Dr. Stone and I are here. I'm going to ask you to stand and just respond in obedience this morning. <laughs>